so this is this is just an incredible environment of how do you focus here? I'm, I'm my my eyes are going out through the plastic to the water out there and to the music that's coming from there, but feels like it's coming from here, and you sort of wonder, what's the reality? Where is the reality? My my theme for today is uh, playing with fire because I like to do that. Um, what does that mean? That means that. Fire is, the, um, fire is the element for transformation. And as a theater director and creator and a filmmaker and an opera director, that's what I do. I try and transform the everyday reality so that for a moment, the audience that comes to see whatever it is that I and my collaborators do are transported. So all of you know that when you were kids, you did this, right? with a little flame here and a wall back there. And it was a rabbit. It was a rabbit. And these creatures were created by the fire that was behind the hand casting it on the wall. Not so different than the allegory of the cave by Plato, which is an incredible story. I don't know how many of you remember it from mythology class or English class or never heard it at all. But it's an amazing story. If you can imagine, it's, a, it's an allegory that all of you are chained to a wall, no, actually to stones, deep down in a cave. And you're facing a wall. And behind you, but you don't know that it's behind you because you can't see. You're just staring at the wall. There's a platform and a fire. And somebody behind, in front of the fire, is manipulating these creatures, these cutouts, these stones, these sculptures, and casting those reflections on the wall. That's your reality. Your reality is the shadows, the illusions. Now, one of you somehow is allowed to be taken out of that cave and up into the light. And for the first time, you see, oh my god, everything that I thought was not real. This is the, art, this is the artist's role. This is the function of the philosopher, the artist, the writer, the, whoever it might be, the one who goes outside and sees the reality from another perspective. Now, sometimes, and in the allegory of the cave by Plato, this, this philosopher could come back down into the cave and be murdered because they don't like it. You don't like that there is some other reality out there, and it feels false. So now you understand also the danger and the power that comes in that position. So when I say playing with fire, yes, there is the word play, because that's what we like to do. That's what we do as children, and we kind of forget about it as adults. But really, playing with fire always means that at a certain point, it can be something magical, can be transformed, forged in the fire, or it can be dangerous and be burned. And I think as an artist, with all of the people that I know, you always have to walk that crater's edge right on the rim of the volcano to be able to bring something new. And it's interesting to hear what we say, rethink, reimagine, renew, that there aren't that many stories. That is true. That is true. There aren't that many stories. That's why myths keep getting told and retold. But it's in the telling of it that you see it with new eyes. and there before it's transformed. It's absolutely transformed. You can have the stories of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana or the stories of the Bible or see how many tempests and how many hamlets. But in the art of the creation and the per performance, that's when you're inspired, the audience. That's when you go, I never saw it that way before. That's when it becomes something fresh and new. Not because it is, but because of the delivery, the presentation. Now, I was a very, very young a woman when I was allowed, I had a fellowship to travel to Eastern Europe, Indonesia, and Japan on a fellowship, Watson Fellowship in visual theater and experimental puppet theater, whatever. I graduated from Oberlin and I went. And I went to Indonesia supposedly for three months and stayed four years. And I have to tell you a tale. I've told it many times. And as Thomas Mann says in the transcript, I'm not afraid to tell it again. Um, this tale, the reason I tell this tale is because I'd been doing theater since I was eight years old, Boston Children's Theater, performing. Um, theater in our lives, it's not a whole lot of theater people up here today or yesterday or tomorrow because we still kind of feel it's with the arts and leisure page. We still sort of see it as that extra thing in life, 
It's not one of the X prizes. It's not something that we feel fundamental. To our very being, as fundamental as drinking water or sleeping. But when I went to Bali 30 years ago, there was no word for artist. Now that is a concept, it's amazing. There's no such thing. You are a carpenter, you play gamelan. You're a teacher, you're a mask performer. It is part of what you do, just as your very being. It is some part of your life. And as we know from the original stories of the uh, first performers or first directors, the shamans, the shamans were the first actors in the world. But they were what we don't actually in the Western world have much of, which is we have physical doctors, we have psychiatrists, but actually the shamans were doctors of the soul and the spirit. They were the mediators between what we perceive as the physical real world with all of its illness, joy, and whatever, but also the connection to the spirit world, which in a way we put into organized religion. And that exact position of the shaman doesn't exist anymore. But I'm going to tell you a story that was so astounding to me when I was in Bali. I'd been performing with a troupe circling a volcano, came to a village that was having a ceremony that they have every five years as an initiation ceremony to initiate the young men into adulthood. I was alone for a moment in this village square under a giant banyan tree, one of the kinds of trees that have the roots that go into the ground. And it was, this, this is a trunyan, way up in what's called the Bali Asli, which are the original Balinese. And I was sitting under this tree, just resting, listening to a kind of Charles Ivesian concert of gamelan orchestras from all the different villagers who had brought their, their orchestras for these ceremonies, under the full moon. And I sat there just in quiet for a while. And all of a sudden, in the dark, from the rear of that, perform of that space, I saw the glint of mirrors. And out of this darkness emerged, I don't know, could have been 20 old men in full warrior costume with the mirrors all over their costumes. I, th there was nobody around me. There was nobody at all. I was alone in that square. And these men came, and I had seen those men earlier, and they were like this, and now they were like that. And they started to dance and move and come along into that square no light, no audience, just me hidden in the shadows. And from deep within their bellies, these sounds came out. And for an eternity, because what is time after all but how you feel it, for an eternity, I was mesmerized and they performed just under the full moon. And I could only see by that reflecting off of these mirrors. Well, after they finished performing to nobody, they disappeared into the shadows. And out came a young man with a propane lantern and hung it up on a tree. And then the entire village square filled with people. And a curtain was put up. And the children and the, and the salesmen for all of the juices and whatever to drink, the celery juice or whatever, they came out. And for the next nine hours all night, they did an, an opera. But they had lights. They had the propane lanterns. And the audience would cheer and laugh and have a whole existence. Who were those people performing for before that? I'd, I'd been in theater all my life, really, all my life, even in the backyard and you know, on the trees and the garage. And it really, really made me think they were performing for God. Now, I say that, and it's whatever you take from it. All that is is the only way that we can, in our thinking process, put into a word of something that is intangible and interior. And it makes you do the greatest thing that you can do. And that, at that point in my life, said, check it every single time. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you doing this? Why are you a hedge fund? Why are you a this? Why are you a, an actor? Why are you a teacher of literature? Why, what is it that motivates you? Because those people weren't getting reviews. They weren't getting money. They weren't getting adulation. They were doing it. Were they forced into it? I don't know. But I know that the incredible movement that I saw in the music was so inspiring and so, so profoundly uh, detailed that it had to be something else. And that I brought home with me. Inside of me as a performer and as a, as, well, I'm not really a performer, but as a, as a, as a director who is supposedly 
going to try and inspire other people to get somewhere with the projects we pick. So because we have limited time, I'm going to jump to some of the highlights. Many of you probably have seen the theatrical production of The Lion King. I, I, how many people have seen it? Well, thank you. But that's, that's a lot of people, so now I can use it as a reference. Because some of those other things you haven't seen, they're ephemeral. Theater is beautiful because it's there and it's gone, and it's horrible too. But that is the truth. It is an ephemeral medium, and it, and it will keep living because of that very nature, that it can't be codified and put on tape successfully. But anyway, The Lion King, what I took from the story I just told you is I, as a designer of the costumes, I said, look, when, the, when I make these, these um, uh, uh, corsets for the lionesses, I want them to be made out of real beads. I don't want to use plastic beads. I don't want Ursa. I don't want it. So are you all there for this? Can we make it out of the real thing? Why? Because it's not just about what the audience sees from the 20th row. It's about what the performer feels wearing it and it makes a huge difference. And that kind of attention to detail, we have to be very careful about in a society where the internet and technology, and I, I know that I've said this for 14 years, Saul will laugh at me, but I'll say, eh, that's ugly, it's ugly. You know, if you want to choose between looking at that and looking at that but without the plastic, I don't think any of you would have a question on what's more aesthetically pleasing, moving, dimensional, three-dimensional. So we've, we have to live with the wonders, and I adore technology, but the things that we lose in it, actually I can go back and talk about my first show that I ever did. And this is in reference to innovation. So in Indonesia, I had a fellowship in this theater, visual theater, and I had an idea to do a show, and it was called Jalanya Salju, which means way of snow. And of course, there's no snow in Indonesia. But I made a trilogy, Eskimo Indonesia New York City trilogy, and it was about modernization and insanity. So, and it relates to the idea of the shaman. The first section I won't talk about, which was the Eskimo, because seven minutes. But the second section, which was about modernization in Indonesia, I got from just, when you're an outsider, and I encourage you to always be an outsider, because that's how you reappreciate everything you have, and everything you do is to go outside and walk the rim and look back. I, as an outsider in Java, would see beautiful shadow puppet plays. The shadow puppet plays, like the Plato's Cave, were the leather shadow puppets on a screen, and traditionally, the women would sit on the performance, the um, audience side, and never be allowed behind because they were, those shadows were the ancestor spirits, the Bayangan. Only the men got to see on the other side and be able to watch the artifice and the creation. Of course, that's changed now, but that's, that's traditional. Well, traditionally, they use an oil lamp and leather shadow puppets, and the leathers are all intricately carved, and they're beautifully dyed with paint. But when you're on that side, you only see the shadow. Only the people on the side of the performer get to see that they're beautifully painted. So the, actually, the, the man who sits there, the artist who's painting all of that, that's an art in of itself. That's part of the act. It's not just the end presentation, the process of it, how you put yourself into it. That's infused into those puppets. And I'd see these incredible shows with the light, firelight, firelight flickering and these beautiful images going on. Now, at the time that I went 30 years ago, they were switching to electric light bulb because it was efficient, faster, glossy. And so I did a show where it was just a story about an ox cart trying to bring his produce to the city, and he's passed by different kinds of carts, and soon he's passed by motorcycles, and soon he's passed by big trucks. And, and as the leather ox cart was moving towards stage right, I switched from oil lamp to electricity, and I switched from leather shadow puppetry to plastic, to plexiglass puppets painted in bright colors. And as you know, as soon as you put that bulb on, there is no flickering light, there is no spirit, there's no soul, but what you get is you get incredible impact on that screen. The meaning was in the medium. The meaning of the show was in the actual technology and transformation from one technology to another. And the Indonesians went 
oh my God, because from, from their point of view, the, the people, I were, they were too close to actually see what they were losing. And I think when you look at my work, even in the films, what I'm interested in is, please remember the tactile, remember the um, visceral, don't forget the sweat, don't lose that kind of uh, humanity, don't think that one technology replaces another, you just have to balance them out and see what are they good for. And that, that's very critical. So that story of, of, of my innovation or innovation that was going in a very simple way is something that I think we also need to talk about. I think when we're talking about danger is risk. You all talk about risk, and we all admire risk. And yet, I think it's so much, I've been through this this year. I've been through a very, very risky, difficult year. If you bother to read the papers or whatever, you would know. And, and it's very, very hard to stay on course, especially in an age of blogging incessant chatter, so many opinions. How do you do that? So I'm going to tell you one more story. And that is, again, in Indonesia. For some wild, stupid idea, I decided with this French gypsy Algerian actor who was traveling with me to climb a living volcano. Actually, it was a dead volcano next to a living volcano. But the volcano we could see, uh, uh, Gunung Batur, was sprouting fire and spitting, but it wasn't erupting in that way. So we thought, OK, we can go up there every 15 minutes or so. And we'd already been there for two years, so somehow you get into your mind that it's OK, it'll be OK, we'll be protected. And we're wearing sarongs, and I'm 22, and thongs and not hiking boots. And we climb up. And it's much easier to go up. And this is all, this is another parable. It's much easier to go up than it is to go down. Much easier. So you keep climbing, and you've got the roots and the rocks, and you get to the top. And Yoman, he took a Balinese name, disappeared into the sulfur smoke, just went off. And I found myself on the edge of a crater dead crater, down into the hole that way, sheer rock face to the right, and about 20 feet or so, 20 meters, 20 feet, into this incredible smoky volcanic that was fire spitting. I couldn't go back the way I'd come up. Impossible. I would have, I would, just couldn't. It was too root. It was too hard. So I remembered something that I had read. It was actually Castaneda at the time. And I just, I let my cameras go. I let my thongs go that way, and I got down on all fours on that line, and I grabbed and held to the side of that. And I kept my focus on the line, and I put the blinders on, and the wind was blowing, and it was crazy. But I managed to crawl my way across that incredible ravine, that incredible crater, because I stayed on the line. Now, that doesn't mean you don't hear the wind. It doesn't mean you're not aware of the danger. But you have to stick to it, especially in a time that we have now. I was looking at the speakers here. How can they talk with that? that, that? How? How do you stay focused? We have to know that focus, focus is probably one of the hardest things that young people and all of us have to do right now. And we get very confused because we think so many people talk in numbers. I go blur when I hear numbers and statistics. I just blur. I blur with too much information coming. So in this world, the focus is something that is the only way that innovation and new ground can be made. When I was working on The Lion King, there was a lot of doubt. But there were no focus groups, and there was no scoring, and there was none of that. Norman Lear told me that, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when they did the test scoring of All in the Family, pfft, panned. Yeah. Terrible. The worst test scores. Why? Breaking ground does not test score well. Just know that. It will not. Because people can't immediately, like that, say, oh yeah, I like that, because I know it. I like it. People don't want to say they're bigot. They're not going to say they like bigots. So there's no way that they could immediately think Archie Bunker was just a cool guy and you'd like to have him as a neighbor. It tested badly, but his companions, Norman's padres, his, his, the people around him supported him and supported the show, and look what happened. It's very, very important to know that we have to stick to these ideas what, what did I hear yesterday? If you're in hell, just keep going. There were a couple of good ones. We don't want Sistine Chapels on the floor. I loved all of those. There she is over there. Those were some beautiful quotes. 
and that this is the only way that we can actually transform our society and see it in a cubistic way. I'm not about reality TV. First of all, it's not my reality. I don't know if it's your reality. I think that my job out there is to put a, a focus, a camera on this side of the head, that side of the head, this way, so that every time you experience a story and experience something that is the same old story as we've heard, you see it with fresh eyes. I want to take you to places you don't know you want to go, and I don't actually know how to get there. Thank you.